Welcome everyone to Coaching in a Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about a different way of thinking. Now, it's going to be similar to mindset, but it's going to be a little bit deeper, a little bit different, and it's going to have different terminologies. So I had to bring on someone who was well-versed in this type of education. So today we're going to be talking with Steven Rudolph, who is an educator. And we're going to be talking about something that is going to help you reach success and happiness at a more easy rate with minimum amount of effort. And you might think, minimum amount of effort, sign me up ASAP. And I agree, you need to sign up as soon as possible because if we can be as efficient as possible in our days, we have the ability to be that top 2%. That means those Elon Musk, those Bill Gates, those Steve Jobs, those people who reach high levels of proficiency, of efficiency, guess what happens? We can also be them. Now, how we do that, that's going to depend on who we are. Might be our environment who we are naturally, our upbringing. There's so many factors that we have to understand before we can go off and just excel greatly or wildly in the world. There's a lot of things we need to know. So this interview with Steven and myself is going to help us get to that place we want to know. But before we do that, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and to share this episode so we can help people also reach more happiness, reach more success, and reach a better life. Because if you really ask yourself, do you want to be happy? The answer should be yes. If you ask yourself, do you want to be successful? The answer should be yes. Now, you might have a limiting belief and you might believe that success and happiness is not allotted for you, that there's just no more in the world that you can't get. Well, that's a limiting type of mindset. You think that there's not enough. There's a scarcity in your brain. Well, I'm here to encourage you to dare to challenge that statement because there is enough happiness, there is enough success for you. So if you are interested in being successful, if you're interested in being happy, then you will want to watch this episode all the way through. Not because coaching a session is going to be helping you get to a better life, but the things that we talk about specifically in this episode are going to be vital and essential to your growth and your future. So let's get into that interview with Steven Rudolph and myself. Welcome, Stephen Rudolph, to Coaching New Session. How are you doing today? Doing great, Michael. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I have you on. You're an educator and you have a unique way of thinking. And here on Coaching in Session, it's all about mindset. And when I can find someone with a different and unique way of thinking, I have to have a mind because they have something to share to the world. So in your own words, can you please tell the world what you do and how you help them? Yeah, sure. So what I do, what I do is I help people identify their natural abilities and to align those abilities with what they do. And the, what they do could be their work, it could be their leisure activities. And my understanding or my belief is that when you identify with what your innate talents are, it changes things. It makes you more balanced. It makes you more harmonious. And you don't need to try as hard in order to be content and to find the things that you want in life and to be able to thrive. Mm. And so the unique way that I talk about this is in terms of tigers. So I explain that your natural abilities are like tigers and each of those tigers needs to eat and they eat activities, of course, not, Mm. not little animals and whatnot. Um, And when you feed your tigers the right amount, and those, those things could be like a, um, an entertaining tiger. So that's a tendency to want to amuse other people. I tell jokes, tell stories. And so that's how you would feed it by doing those things. An educative tiger would be a tendency to explain things, to get other people to realize things. A healing tiger would be a tendency to find pain in other people and to help them get out of that pain or imbalance that they might be in. And a creative tiger is one that innovates. And so when your tigers get to do those things, that's when you feel like you feel like you're in your skin. You feel like who you really are. And when you aren't feeding those tigers, then I say they eat you. So my, my basic mantra is feed your tigers before they eat you. 
There's a saying, it's like a Cherokee Indian Native American saying where there's a grandfather who was an elder in the town and then he had a grandson. And he was telling his grandson, he said, grandson, I have two wolves inside of me. He says, one wolf is kindness, happiness, all of those wonderful things, those positive things. And then another wolf was going to be those negative connotations, mm. anger, hate. Then he was talking about how it's the war between those two wolves. Mm. And the grandson is interested. And he's like, well, which one wins? And the grandfather says, whichever one you feed. Mm. Is the tiger the same type of thing? Like when we're talking about the tigers, I know there's so many different tigers, but is yeah. it the same thing? Like how we, how we feed those tigers inside of us, which one wins? That, that's a great question. The dimension that you're speaking of is one, it's a different plane. It's a different dimension. And this is the plane of values, or um, I can put it really nicely in terms of a traditional Ind Indian concept, but here I'm talking about the India, uh, the, the country India. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I went there for 21 years and I did a deep dive into the traditional um, literature and had people who were Sanskrit scholars. I worked with them to, to try to unlock some of the ancient secrets are like 5,000 years old that talk about these topics. And what's said about this is that there's a dimension of how much pro-social you are, how much you're out to help the world versus how much you're out to help yourself. So mm -hmm. that those two poles or those two ends would be those two tigers or th those two wolves that are being expressed in this story. Mm -hmm. So you could you could view that as sort of like a, a horizontal axis, like how which side are you are you leaning toward? Right. The vertical one, if you were to make like a cross section of that, that's what my tigers are. So in other words, let's just say that you had a, an educative tiger like that's a big one. You have all of them. So you have this big educative tiger. You love to teach. You love to explain things. Now, you could explain things in a way that benefits other people, that you're teaching them something wholesome, whether it's teaching them language or teaching them about life skills or teaching them how to succeed in their business and so on and so forth. You could also teach people how to do something dangerous, something illegal, something which is detrimental to the society, other people, et cetera. So in that case, it's still the educative tiger but you're doing it for a purpose which is antisocial. And so if you look at those quadrants, the best place to place yourself would be in the, in the, the upper right quadrant, which would be you're feeding the, your actual tigers, the ones that are your big ones, and you're doing it for a purpose which is socially beneficial. Like that's the ideal. So, mm -hmm. so it's like a combination of both of these. And you could see it too. Like look at, on, there's an entrepreneurial tiger. So this is a tendency to create value. Now, you could be running a company, and we've seen a lot of people in the world of business run businesses in a way which is antisocial. They'll do things which benefit them and absolutely crush other people. They might lie. They might cheat. They might swindle people. And so that's an entrepreneurial tiger at work. It's to Look at Bernie Madoff. There's a good example. Mm -hmm. Totally good example of somebody who's on the opposite side. He would be in the upper left-hand quadrant. So that would be... He's feeding his entrepreneurial tiger, but it's completely antisocial. And so here, the interesting thing is that it's easier to traverse this values continuum than it actually is the, the tigers that I'm talking about. What I mean by that is it's easier to step on the right side of the tracks mm -hmm. than it is to say, okay, um, I have a really big entertaining tiger, um, or I have a really small, let's just say, interpersonal tiger. Like, I don't love interacting with people, but I want to change that. It's actually much, much more difficult. I don't even think you can change your tigers. I, I think they're, they're mm -hmm. largely what they are. And so, therefore, it's, it's better to engage the tigers you have in a way that's, that suits them the most, that suits the situations that, that you encounter the most. And that you do your best. My belief is that and everything that I've seen in the traditional literature, especially like some, some of those things that I was learning, it was never about somebody changing themselves in terms of they used to like not be good at doing this and then they became good at doing it. Or, you know, they were doing this kind of work and then they changed themselves to become another kind of person. What usually happens is that there's a change of heart. Like if you take a look at the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's um, concept about how the hero goes through these phases, the hero leans into who 
they are and what their strengths are and what their natural abilities are. That's those are the tigers. They lean into those things. And then usually there's some kind of a, a question like, you know, Luke, join the dark side, right? Mm-hmm. So there's that that question that am I going to stay on the good, right side of the tracks or am I going to be swayed by by the dark side? And so there's that reckoning that happens. And so in most of the literature that I've seen, that's the big challenge to the individual, which is which is to make that choice of which wolf to feed or which side of the tracks or which type of energy you want to align yourself with. Nonetheless, what's what's looked at what's looked at less is this idea of which are my natural abilities and what should I be doing? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the values is a whole nother thing. And most people are still caught up at the level of who am I and what should I be doing? Like according to my natural abilities. So they usually wind up in one of the bottom quadrants, which is they're either nurturing the wrong tigers, but they're on the goods, on, they're on the right side of the tracks. They're, they're with the, the force. Or the opposite is that they're nurturing the wrong tigers and they're with the dark side. Those are people who are the most detrimental to society, the, the ones who create the most, the most problems for themselves and, and for others. When we look at those four quadrants, I'm going to use the American society as the guinea pig or the example. School kind of makes children conform. Now, children are so unique and they're so creative and there's so much imagination in, in their minds. And when we put them through the school system, by the time they come out, their thoughts, their beliefs, their values are typically aligned with what they learned. It's not so much anymore of, let me look on the inside of who I am and then come out and express who I am. We are basically conditioned to act a certain way, to think in a certain way, and then to be in a certain way. So when we're in elementary school, we sit down, we don't say anything out of line, out of place. If we need something, we raise our hand. If we have to draw something, we can draw something and say, this is a beautiful sky. And then all of a sudden the teacher is like, that's not a sky. There's no stars. There's no sun. Now we're basically saying, this is not a sky to that kid. And that could be a Van Gogh, right? right. So Van Gogh yeah. came in, he had those circles, those swirls. So if you make like a, a blue sun, the teacher's going to say, hey, the sun's not blue, right? Exactly. So yeah. now those kids are basically growing up saying, I can't even be true to myself because now I'm not accepted. So when we look at those tigers, is there an acceptance part? Meaning, oh, there's a nice group of tigers in this area. I want to be with them versus I want to be true to myself. I would look at this in two parts. So the first is we have a a nature and nurture aspect here. In other words, each of us has a genetic code within us that inclines us towards certain types of behavior, ways of being, proclivities, abilities, and whatnot. Like some people are born with a physicality that just allows them to be natural athletes, let's just say right? They're just sort of born with that. Some people are born with that, with a musical tiger. So for them, music comes naturally. Other people have a natural linguistic capability or a natural ability ability with numbers. Now, of course, all of those can be built upon, but that depends on the environment that you're in. So if you've got a natural physical, you're endowed really, you know, physically, If you're in an environment that encourages you to play sports and there's the right guidance and there's a good coach and all of those things, well, certainly you're going to be able to feed those tigers and come out of that experience really well off. Or if it was music and you had the opportunity to play an instrument or be in a band um, and, and so on, and that was nurtured, that's going to benefit you. So it's important to recognize that experiences and especially the school experience, the early, you know, the early years, they're very telling and uh, influential in terms of the, you know, how we, how we form and how we evolve and, and develop. So let's just say this, that schools, and they're all different, but I understand what you're saying. There is a similarity. There's the factory style education that, that exists that, that's been around for, you know, 100, 150 years. That environment favors certain types of tigers. Let's be clear about that. In other words, if your linguistic tiger is a big one, it favors you because there's a lot of language and reading and comprehension. If your logical tiger is a big one, well, then that favors you because there's a lot of mathematics and things related to math and science and 
you know, algebra, statistics, uh, trigonometry, calculus, and so on. So um, the sciences. But, so if you're natural, and so if, if you've got two tigers, linguistic and logical, which are both big ones, then you're really favored in a situation. You have a super advantage. And that's why, you know, I used to see, because my linguistic is, I would say, above average. My logical is not so high. So I used to watch other kids in my class who were, who had these monstrous, logical tigers and just sail through all the mathematics classes, you know, Mm -hmm. meanwhile, for me, I'd be struggling like anything. And so they would put in a little bit of effort and get a huge return, a little bit of effort, put a huge return. Me, I'd be putting in a huge effort and getting little return. And so it's important to understand that this environment is going to favor certain types of, of people. That's important to realize. The second thing is that as you're rightly pointing out, our education system does very little to get us to self-reflect and to look inside and ask the question, who am I? What are my natural abilities? How do I align these natural abilities with work that I'm going to do in the future? Like I'm constantly shocked when I meet young guys and gals and I ask them, what are your plans for your future? They're teens. It could be anywhere like, you know, 15 through 18, let's just say. And they don't even know how to, some have ideas and some, some don't, but I've noticed that they don't have a clear way of thinking about it. They don't, nobody ever equipped them with the tools on how you think about identifying a career or a career path. It's really very random. And I saw a statistic sometime back that said something like 60 plus percent of students who graduate college don't even know what they're going to do when they graduate. Like that's, if you think about all the time and the energy and all the exams that you took, all of the stress that you went through, and you go through all of that, and at the very end of it, you, you don't know why you did all of that, then something's really wrong. And so the second part that I'm addressing here is that, yeah, there's a fundamental problem with the education system in that it's not helping people to figure out what their tigers are. So while they're in school and when they get out, they basically say, yeah, you know, my uh, administrative tigers is a big one. My interpersonal is a big one. My entrepreneurial is not that big. Therefore, I'm not going to try to start my own company, but I would be much better off working with somebody else to be a a COO or a controller in a company, or I might do something in finance as opposed to being the entrepreneur, for example. I see so many people getting out and everybody wants to start their own company and be their own boss, et cetera, but not everybody's got that entrepreneurial tiger. And then they do that to their dismay. I've seen so many people who've, who are wantapreneurs and they get to a certain point midlife or later on and they realize it never happened. And I can't blame people because nobody ever helped them to understand where they, I've even seen the opposite, Michael. I've seen somebody who had a really big entrepreneurial tiger, really big administrative and logical. Now think about this, super logical guy. He's really organized and he knows how to put a business together. At the same time, small, interpersonal, small, educative. And the guy can't get a company going. He can't retain people and he can't scale it. So he's got great ideas, but when he tries to bring people together, he doesn't feel the need to really educate or to effectively delegate or to onboard them because he only wants to keep a distance from people and spend as little time as possible with them. So if you don't know these things and nobody shows them to you, then you get out in the world and you just you curse your luck or you curse fate or you say it's circumstantial or you you start to um, say, okay, it was uh, just another, I'm learning, I'm failing fast forward. We make up these little stories to to try to satisfy ourselves, like why are not content or why it's not working? I mean, you touched on so many important things there and I really want to dive down and break as much as we can apart. The first thing is the school system is sometimes not nurturing our tiger, right? Our, our dominant tiger, where we might be an athletic person, but our school has no sports. So that mm-hmm. tiger just kind of sits by the wayside. We look at everyone else that's doing so well, we're basically putting in extra work to get minimal return while people are putting in minimal amount of work and getting maximum amount of return. So we're looking at that and we're saying, man, like I suck. And it could lead to negativity, a different way of thinking. Now, that person might not look for sports, might not gravitate towards sports because they weren't conditioned in sports. So they kind of fall into that lower left quadrant where they're going to be one of those people in society that are just doing the wrong thing. And just because they were trained to keep doing one thing and they never saw 
the other side. And it's similar to now we get into these teens, these high school students who are now going off into college and they don't even know what they're getting into. Mm. As you said, 60% of these students don't even know what they're going to do or what that job entails. They basically pick a major and they might look at salary or they look at their parents and they say, okay, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then they get into a job that they don't love, that they hate, and now they're miserable, they're unhappy, and they really can't find that tiger that should be there and flourish. They just kind of follow through with whatever happens in their life. So where I see the problem here is in the definition of success. We tend to look at success in external terms, in terms of things like how popular you are, how famous you are, how much money you have, how many possessions you have, how many houses you have, what kind of airplane, you you know, so on and so forth. That's what our society has come to use as the measuring stick, the art stick of, of what success means. I would like to flip it around. And we also know another thing, which is, and I've, I know this from my personal experience, I've seen people with like untold amounts of wealth, the most miserable people that I've met. Not everybody. I also know some people who are, who are insanely rich, um, but at the same time are really, really happy people. So one thing we know for sure is that being famous or being wealthy is not a guarantee for happiness and contentment. So that's, that's just really obvious. But one thing is there that's for sure is I would like to flip around the definition of success. To me, Success is when an individual knows their natural abilities and they know in every circumstance or every situation that they approach, how they can best play their hand, how they can best apply themselves, whatever the circumstance is. And just like in a game of chess, you know, there's, you're, you're on the board and you've got certain pieces. There are dozens, hundreds, thousands of moves you can possibly make. Some are better than others, but it's not like your limit. It's not like there are only three moves. So coming back to your example before about school, somebody might be really endowed w- with respect to their their um, bodily abilities or their athleticism. But just because that school doesn't have a great athletic program, it doesn't automatically mean that now they're completely blocked on the board, that they have no moves to make. Mm-hmm. What I mean to say is maybe that individual is in, has an incredible, has a really big tiger that might be, as I said before, healing, or it might be adventurous. So you have bodily healing and adventurous. You know, those three things together go really well in terms of things like being a paramedic or somebody who could even do volunteer work for um, things along working for a volunteer fire department or emergency healthcare, et cetera, where you don't have to necessarily be a doctor. They might get to drive the ambulance really fast. And that might be a way for them to satisfy that tiger because a lot of times it comes out sideways, right? They don't get a chance to use those qualities in a way which is socially meaningful or productive. And so then they wind up drag racing and flipping their car over and, you know, that, all those kind of things. So, mm-hmm. and in fact, I just worked with a young, a young man who wanted to be a race car driver, right? That was one of the things he wanted, but there was no route for him actually to, there were no places for him to practice. There was nobody to guide him. And that's, that's what he found. He found becoming a paramedic was a way that he could feed those tigers and put them together. So to me, the success is that, that I can look at this situation, whatever the the habitat that I'm in and say, look, these are my tigers. How can I put my best tigers forward in this situation? And that's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. It's not that like you do it once and like you live happily ever after. All of us face uh, changes in our lives, right? It's like, something happens. We lose our jobs. We have to, we get married. Um, somebody dies. There, there are so many things that become turbulent in our lives that we have to adapt to. And success is when I say, okay, this is new, this is change, but here's how I'm going to address it. And there's a way forward for me. There's always a way forward. That to me is the most successful person. And whether that person has the fame and the wealth or et cetera, or they're just okay, you know, they're, they're fine they're going to love their lives. Their lives will be meaningful and they'll find pleasure in the doing. They'll find pleasure in the engaging of the tigers, not in what they get or what they possess, or those things are very fleeting in terms of the pleasure that they get. When I work with young people nowadays, it seems like every question I ask them, and these are profound critical thinking questions, they always say, I never thought of that. And I would just ask, well, where do you want to be in 10 years? Right, Just something like that. I never thought about that. What do you like? 
I never thought about that. Like they might know what they enjoy. They might know what their friends do. But when I really ask them, what do they want? What will they not allow? They really have to think about it. And that's just, you know, going into your expectations, what you're going to allow in your life. And many people don't give themselves those expectations. And I want to kind of use me as an example today for the tigers, right? Because me growing up, a little bit of backstory for anyone who's new to the podcast today, grew up in the ghetto. My parents, they worked extremely hard to send us all the private schools. I have, a, I have an older brother, younger sister. So they sent us to private schools and I went on sheltered from the ghetto. So you think about the ghetto, think about what happens in there, drugs, violence, all that. So if I went to a public school, it would have been rampant. I would have seen that. That would have been my primary environment where I was a little bit sheltered since I was in a private school, but it was still there because it was still in the hood or in the ghetto. Now, I was also raised by wonderful grandmothers. They were kind, sweet, raised in the church, went to church, holidays, special events every Sunday. As I was growing up, we had the opportunity to go to another private high school. So I chose to go to a college prep school where it was like, all right, I'm going to go to college versus, okay, well, I'm just going to get an education, a college education, then I'll figure out where I want it to go. And I remember in my senior year, I was good at accounting. I had got an internship working for Sikorsky. They built the Black Hawk helicopters for the U.S. Army. And I was doing really well. Math was my strongest skill or subject. Math was my thing. Reading, not so much quite yet. I was getting there. Sports wasn't really my thing. I played volleyball here and there, but I really didn't find a passion for it. But math, I, I was good with and art, I was pretty good with too. I didn't know how to play an instrument at that time. And so college, when I finally go off to college, now I'm learning how to play an instrument. Now I'm learning how to enjoy English, reading, writing, all of that things. It's just like, it took me until college to appreciate music and then to really fall in love with it for years and to go off and get a music degree. And then also for my writing to today where I write weekly blogs. And also I just finished writing my first book. Of course, I have to do the edit still and then publish all of those things. But I accomplished something I probably would have never thought I could do when I was in high school. I want to kind of use me as an example of maybe how my tigers were maybe dominant when I was in elementary school and how they began to form, or if I just always had the same tigers, it's just, I started to make myself more aware of them. I I think it's very much the, the latter that they exist and they're there. It's just that they need the environment to, to turn on. I'll give you a, a really interesting example. It's something totally different, and it comes out of the world of nature. And there's the Atacama Desert, which I believe is in Chile. And and it's one of the driest places on Earth. It never rains there. If you see photographs of it, it's just like, you know, desert sand color for miles, like these dunes and, and mountains and very, very sparse. In 2015, there was a slight amount of rain that... um that came down on the Atacama Desert. And suddenly the entire desert turned pink. You can Google this if you if you search for Atacama Desert pink, you'll see the, the pictures there. So what happened was there were these seeds, there were these like flowers, these pink flower seeds that were below the surface of the, of the desert in the sand. And because it wasn't raining, they weren't uh, blooming. And the minute the water hit, they bloomed. And so I believe it's very much the same thing with people, which is that you've got those abilities, but if you don't get that environment, let's say it's the musical part, the musical thing. So that's there within you. But the moment you get this opportunity to go into a, you know, a situation where there's a teacher and classes and you learn a bit of theory, then the tiger wakes up. What happens is if you put and this is another graph or another way to think about it. How do you know if a tiger is big? You know it's big if, if when you put a little bit of energy into it, you get a, a big return for it, as I was alluding to before. If you put in a little bit more energy, you get a big return out of that. So, um, and, and the opposite side is there. So if you work really hard at music and it's just not getting better, and you're working really hard at it and it's just not getting better, that's a sign that the tiger is not naturally that, that big. It doesn't mean that you don't have to, that, that you never have to work at it. Even 
people who are gifted, of course, in order to achieve higher levels, they have to work at it. But what happens is that their speed or their, their pace of becoming highly competent and gaining expertise is much, much faster. They can become accomplished um, musicians or performers, or if it's language, they can get there in a much shorter period of time. You, you've heard probably this Malcolm Gladwell has popularized that the concept of the 10,000 hour rule, that in order to become an expert in something, it takes 10,000 hours of practice roughly in order for you to get there. Now, there have been other people who've debunked that and they've analyzed that. What I've understood is that if your natural abilities are there and you get the environment and you make an effort and you get a teacher that guides you, well, then maybe it doesn't take uh, 10,000 hours. Um, I recall reading a biographical piece about um, Philippe Petit. You might have seen uh, Man on Wire uh, or the movie uh, Wire, where he had wa walked between the, uh, the Twin Towers on a uh, high wire, on a tightrope in the 70s. And I remember one of the lines very, very clearly where he talks about learning how to walk on the wire. He said, in a year, I taught myself everything that there was to know about walking the wire. And that's, that's unimaginable. But what that demonstrates to me is, I mean, we know that he was pr probably one of the greatest high wire walkers ever, is that he had that capacity. And he pretty much taught himself, you know, and it's a year. So what that means is that those qualities are there within people. And given the environment, given the circumstance, and maybe the encouragement and, and so on, yes, that's when people can develop these, these qualities. And what I want to say is that it's unfortunate that this, these opportunities are not there for everybody, but I at least want to give people hope that if they understand what these qualities are and they lean into them, you've got the greatest chance at least of finding the, the, a possible route forward, even though, look, you've had, you had a very incredible opportunity to be able to have those environments which allowed you to flourish like that. What about other people who don't have that? Is, is it hopeless for them? And um, while you know, it would be great to pontificate and talk about all ways that we could eliminate poverty and give everybody the same chances, that, that's not gonna be realistic, but I do believe that it's realistic to, to at least bring this basic principle to people. And that's what I've dedicated my life to over the, for the last few years. I was involved in other projects as well. I was involved in e-health and et cetera. I had a school that I started in India that I led for like 20 years. And I put that all behind me to get behind one simple concept, which is, can we, can I help people understand that Everybody's got a natural, a bunch of tigers. Some are big and some are medium and some are small. And if you figure out what they are and you get down with them, you've got your greatest chance, no matter what situation that you're in, to be able to get aligned and to find a way that you can be content in life. So that's, that's what I'm after. It's a simple principle. What would happen if the whole world united with their primary and dominant tiger, where they stopped looking at that little tiger or the tiger they weren't good at, and they just started focusing on their maybe top three. Would the world change drastically or would it just be maybe a natural flow of more people being inclined to maybe finding success in their own right rather than what society labels success as? I think what would happen is everybody would be hysterically laughing. That's what I think would happen. That because they would see the absurdity of all these weird things that go on around us. And they would say, okay, if that's what you're going to throw at me, like jujitsu, then I'm going to throw this move at you. Oh, you want to throw that one at me? I'm going to throw this one. At that, that's how people would be approaching it. They would, people wouldn't be taking things so personally. People wouldn't be setting themselves up for unrealistic expectations and then being devastated when they can't become who they thought they wanted to be and so on and so forth. So you, you'd see far more content people. At the same time, I don't think that it doesn't mean that problems go away. It doesn't mean it wouldn't mean that um, challenges would go away. It would mean that people would be far more adept at um, coming face to face with those challenges. I mean, that said, your question, of course, is a hypothetical one. And, you know, we would never get to a, a level like that. But I, I would like to share this. I believe that it is possible 
that if there's enough momentum generated in this direction and more people get good with their tigers, here are some positive changes that could definitely take place and we could even see within our lifetime, I believe. So talk about like, you know, um, the environment and reducing our ecological footprint. So one of the things that I understand is that when I'm in, in alignment with my tigers, I consume a heck of a lot less. What does that mean? So let's just say like right now in this moment, my educative tiger, which is a big one, is totally eating because I'm explaining stuff, right? My entertaining tiger is there. You know, I'm joking around with you. I'm being dramatic and I'm, right? So that's also being fit. My intrapersonal tiger, the one that talks about deep things and spiritual things and, and whatnot, that's also engaged right now. My linguistic is also engaged right now. My creative is also engaged, coming up with examples on the spot, et cetera. So I have this team of big tigers right now that are all firing. And in my brain, what's going on is there's a release of dopamine, right? So my brain is enjoying this. And as I keep thinking, we get to keep talking where my brain keeps secreting dopamine, which is this feel good feeling. When you mirror back to me positivity and you, you say things which might be either you're right or maybe you say something which um, you might praise me about something. So then serotonin releases. And then I feel like I, I'm maybe an expert in my field and I feel like I'm, I'm doing something right and this is valuable. And then you're bonding with me. You're connecting with me. So oxytocin is releasing in my brain. So we're having this exchange and we're feeling closer to each other. So while this is going on, I'm swimming in my brain is just like, you know, it's like submerged or it's like marinating in these, uh, in these neurotransit, these, these neurochemicals, these, these happy chemicals is what they're referred to as. But if we're not doing this and I'm not aligned with those, those particular tigers and I'm doing other stuff that's not um, conducive to my natural abilities, well, then those aren't being released. And when they're not being released, I feel frustrated. I feel stuck. I feel angry. I feel frustrated. And so I need to get those chemicals released. So what do I do? I drink some coffee, two or three or a really big one, or I eat some chocolate or I have a coffee and chocolate. And then I might smoke a cigarette or maybe have a drink or somebody might go for, a, for smoking something or take some sort of drugs or go shopping or divert myself with some video games or something. Because those activities are going to loosen me up and, and get that, that sort of flow going. All of those activities are going to create toxins. They're going to encourage me to consume more, which has its impact across the planet. So my belief is that rather than try, you know, there's this expression that, you know, you're trying to grab your ear, like, you know, by putting your hand around one side and like go, going under your chin and around to the other side to grab your ear when you could just like put your hand up and grab, grab your ear just like that. So we're trying to do all this green technologies and stuff like that, but we don't want to stop our consumption. And the reason we don't want to stop our consumption, let's go back to the root of it. There, there was a, a wonderful documentary called The Planet of the Humans. It's on um, YouTube. I believe it's still free. And they, they basically, um, well, I mean, they, they debunk a lot of the green and eco-sustainable uh, initiatives saying that it's just like, you know, taking it from one pocket and putting it into the other pocket. And we need uh, the, the real answers. We need to reduce consumption. So my belief is that let's get back to the root. Why are we consuming so much? Because we're not happy. When you're not happy, that there you go. You start to consume because you think that consuming makes you happy. But if I'm involved in doing this kind of thing all day with you, and somebody for somebody else, it's going to be different, Michael. You know, For somebody else, it might be their tigers are being fed because they have a protective tiger, and they love to stand in front of a building or a something or other and, and stand there as a security guard all day. And for them, they're just eating it all. Like their brain is secreting. I'm protecting this place. I'm protecting all day long. That's what's going. I mean, you and me might look at that person and say, hey, whoa, must, isn't that really boring? Wouldn't you be frustrated doing that sort of thing? But if it's somebody who's got a protective tiger, for them, they're getting the same dopamine hit that I might be getting right now, that I'm getting right now at this at, in, in this instance. So to make a sort of long story there, a long explanation short, what I'm trying to say is that if we want to be doing right for the planet and, and if we want to see a change, you know, what, what would it be like? Instead of saying if everybody's tigers were, were being fed, if I said like if 20% of the world were aligned with their tigers, I'm pretty sure that it would have a significant impact on the, on the global catastrophe that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just learned something. I have a huge protective tiger also, because mm -hmm. I know I have an educative tiger, but now I just learned, I was like, wow, I have a protective tiger too. 
because mm-hmm. when I was growing up, again, you know, tell you a quick story. It was like almost every three months, our home was going to be broken into, right? We were just in a bad neighborhood. People would come in, ransack the place, steal the TVs, the VCRs, dating myself. And then we go into home and everything is just distraught. I just thought in my head, like, like I want to be able to protect my family. Like, and that, that, that protective tiger was there. I didn't know what it was called. I didn't necessarily know how to approach this feeling, but it was something that was in my mind. You're right. Like the tigers are there. It's just that we have to make ourselves aware of them. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm doing right now, and it might seem kind of backwards because I'm a mindset coach and you would think my first book should be about mindset, right? I'm a mindset coach and we should be talking about mindset, but that's actually not what my first book is about. My first book is about happiness and mm-hmm. it has to be about happiness. Well, at least my brain is telling me that it has to be about happiness because that's the starting point. Are you happy? Do you want to be happy? How can we be happy? Then we get into the mindset part of it. It's not mm-hmm. the mindset part and then being happy. And I found that to be so interesting on how people work. People will say they want something, but they won't put in the work to get it. So they would rather use more resources and lie to themselves than to say, okay, I'm going to use less resources and then be efficient. That's happiness in a nutshell. Give me more pocketbooks, give me more cars, give me more money, and then I'll find happiness. I'd like to put it into a simple example. Some people dance in order to be happy. And some people dance because they are happy. It's similar to the saying, some people that's feel the rain and some people get wet. Mm-hmm. So that's what I mean by the tigers. So when your tigers are engaged, you're happy. Mm-hmm. When your tigers are not engaged, you make up a story and a whole big plan on what you're going to do and in order to get to there. So when you get there, you're going to be happy or what you're going to get. And that thing that you get is going to, that's that vacation or that's that boat or that's that a certain salary figure or something like that. And so you get there and you get, you get a short amount of you know, temporary happiness, but it goes away pretty quickly because if your tigers aren't being fed, the tiger, and again, if you don't feed your tigers, they're going to eat you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very simple principle. So just keep feeding them. And I'm sure the audience is thinking like, well, how do I find my tigers? Because they have all of this trash in their brain, maybe for, for lack of better terms, all this fluff in their brains of all this extra nonsense where they're not able to focus on, well, let me dive deep and to figure out which tiger I have. What can be one of the first steps that people can take besides working with you on how can they start to find your tigers? Okay, so I'll give you like a quick, all right, let me say this. I've defined like 19 different tigers. Mm-hmm. I've, made, I've made an assessment that will help you figure out which your, your tigers are. But there's another way to do it. Like we don't even have to get technical. Answer these questions, right? Answer these questions. Think about what is it that I do naturally, right? That's the first thing. I do it naturally. That's what a big tiger is going to be. So whether that's like I play music naturally, or I write naturally, or I love to help people naturally, or I love to take risks naturally. Those are things that I do. I love to be with animals. I love to draw color. I do it naturally. It comes to me now. It's the first, the first thing. Number two, when I do that activity, I easily get absorbed in it. So once I start to do it, I lose track of time, hunger, appointments. Like I just get into it and I get absorbed. So if it's like the, the, the healing tiger, like if I start to talk to somebody about their health and how they're feeling, like the next thing I know, three hours have gone by and, and I'm helping them sort out their health issue. Or if it's, as I said before, like something like drawing or art. They look down, they're in the, and the next thing they come out, the whole paper is full and all that time went, but they got completely absorbed. So that's the second one. Another is I seek this out. Nobody has to push me to do it. It's something that I, str- I, I, I have to do, I want to do, I make time for it. I look forward to doing it. So you're self, the answer is, okay, you're self-motivated to do it. That's another thing. Not that you have to bribe yourself to do it. Right. Or you've got to like, you know, force yourself to do it. You are self motivated. Another thing you could do to check is historically look to see have I been like this my entire life? Like, have I always been good at music or have I always been good with art? In some cases, like where you haven't had the opportunity, you might not see it. But this is also usually like if you are interpersonal, Tiger's a big one. You love people. And you're, if you go back to when you were a kid, your parents and grandparents are going to say, oh, gosh, when you were a kid, you just like wouldn't shut up. Your teacher was always sending notes home saying like, 
constantly talking to other kids and blah, blah, blah. So have I been like this historically? Another way that you can check to see if a tiger is big or not is, uh, am I like this in all situations? And I'll give you a good example of this. So some people think like the entertaining tiger, I was talking about that before. And I ask some people like, do you have a big entertaining tiger? And they might say that, oh yeah, I'm definitely entertaining. And I'll say, okay, like, would you um, be like joking around and telling stories if, um, you know, like if you went to a party, would you go around and like, you know, be the life of the party? Oh, well, no, no, no. I mean, not like that. Like I can be funny, but only with people who I know. So that might be that your entertaining tiger is really not as big as you. It might be kind of like average or a little bit above, but somebody who's got a big entertaining tiger, they'll do, they'll be funny and interactive and, and joking around and telling stories with strangers, with people they know. They'll be joking around at a funeral. They'll be joking around, right, when, you know, places they shouldn't be. So that's a sign is that I do it like, I'm like that everywhere. I'm like that everywhere. So I've given here a couple of, um, you know, I do it naturally. Um, I get absorbed when I do it. I'm self-motivated to do it. I historically have been like this and I do it in all uh, contexts. Another way that you can check is that people who you know, who have those tigers that are big, they confirm that, yeah, this is a big tiger. So in other words, if it were the sports thing, the athletic tiger, if somebody who is a, a coach or somebody who is is very well respected and has credentials in that area says you've got talent. Well, that's, that's at least another example. You know, sometimes people miss it. It happens that, you know, some people miss the Beatles and said, okay, these, these guys don't have any talent. So, but that's at least one way. It, so what you need to do is you need to like put it through all these tests and say, okay, let me check to see that does this quality stand up to all of these points? I call, I have seven points like that. I call that my seven way test. It, it's there also on my site, feedyourtigers.com. So you can find the seven way test and you can just cross check to just to see, am I, am I deluding myself? And here's another thing, Michael, that I want to share. Just because a tiger isn't big doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's weak. I don't use the word strong and weak. And I'll give you a good example of this. We were talking about protective, a protective tiger before. So just imagine that you have a huge, that there's a person who's got a huge protective tiger and they're also visual, right? The person gets a job as um, at the airport for the security check when the bags go through, right? So that person's like totally protective, visual, like watching that x-ray, you know, and stuff going through and checking all the stuff. But imagine that same person has a really big entertaining and interpersonal tiger. Love to joke around, love to talk to people. So now suddenly those big, two big tigers are a liability in that specific situation because they're going to want to talk and see all these people going through. And those tigers just want to eat by joking around that, Hey, and they're going to be, and that's going to, that will uh, be detrimental to the success of their work. So the same qualities in a talk show host or an influencer or an actor, that's going to be a huge asset for them. So what I want to point out here is that don't think about tigers and don't think about them in terms of being big and small, not good or bad or strong or weak. And that will, that will also change things. So you can figure out how to find them. And then what are the different combinations that I can use to, to put them together? And I loved everything we talked about today. I knew before even speaking with you on the podcast that it was going to be a great conversation because understanding who we are and basically how we operate is so important. And then you even said it, you know, having that acknowledgement from another person, it kind of invokes like, oh, wow, like I'm good at this. But then I also want to tell my viewers that there's going to be people in the world who are going to say that you can't do something, those limiting beliefs. So they might say, you're not good at a sport, but you really do have a strong tiger in athletics. Look at Michael Jordan, for example. He was cut, I think, on his elementary or his high school basketball team. He could have took that as, oh, I'm not good at sports, but he didn't. So he went on to be someone great even though he had people or he had a time in his life where he wasn't as strong mm -hmm. and, and then he grew from there. So mm -hmm. wherever you are, you can grow and to understand where you're going to be strong, meaning like which tiger might be dominant using that to your advantage. So then you can start to put in a good amount of work and get further rather putting in a lot of work and not getting as far. So I Absolutely. think really diving deep into these 19 Tigers with Steven is going to be an important mindset thing for you to grow and to flourish in your life. 
So if I can from you, Stephen, can you please maybe give a few last words and then tell people again where to find you? Because I know you said your website earlier. Sure. So last words would be this. Your tigers are with you. They're already there. And there's no need to have to go to the ends of the earth. I mean, I went to India, but you don't have to go that far because you wind up chasing your tail ultimately. And I found out just like many people find out wherever you go, there you are. They're right there with you. And if we look inside rather than always looking outside to be something that we're not, but if we look within ourselves and find the qualities that we have, there's a way for every person to find that happiness and to find that success. And that's what I want for people, just to realize and recognize that it's so much easier to find success that way than setting yourself up um, to try to be supposedly successful in an area where you don't got the tigers. So, so that's what I want to share. And where you can find out more information is feedyourtigers.com. So everything's there. It'll tell you what the tigers are and how you can understand more about them. I welcome anybody to get in touch. Thank you so much. Your website and your social links will be in the description box below. So anyone can easily find you, go to your website, and then to dive deep into their tigers and finding out which tigers they need to be maybe focusing on or maybe that they have a natural inclination to. So depending on, on who you are, that's going to be your journey, right? So experience that journey, appreciate that journey and love that journey. And I believe Steven Rudolph is going to be a perfect guy to help you on that journey. Thank you so much, Steven, for coming on Coaching in Session. So much knowledge, so much wisdom, and a great conversation. Thanks, Michael. It was great. Thank you, everyone, again, for watching the interview with Steven Rudolph and myself. As you can see, so much wisdom, so much things that we talked about in this episode. And I encourage you to reach out to Steven and to find out what your tiger is or tigers. Because if we have multiple dominant tigers, multiple strong tigers, we can use them to our advantage. It's similar to getting the higher ground in a battle. If you have the higher ground, you typically have the advantage. So in life, we can continue to fight and struggle, or we can take the high point, the vantage point, and then have a higher probability of success. Happiness is going to ensue. Wealth is going to ensue. All those good things in life are going to ensue. And then we start to also look at society and how that's going to change, where people are starting to operate in the manner of who they were always meant to be rather than who they're trying to be. Now, there's nothing wrong with your journey and how you're approaching life, but if you're doing something and you're under the mindset of making your life more difficult than it needs to be or it has to be, kudos to you for going the rough path, but at the same time, understanding that there are going to be easier routes to get to where you want to be is also mindset. Sometimes I'm working with clients and then and we have our initial conversation, our initial session. After the first session, they're like, brain is blown because I'm telling them all these things that they have to do. And they're so simple. Sometimes our brain can get ahead of us where we don't see sometimes the door that's right in front of us that's open. We're looking at all the doors that are closed. So understanding how we can view things and how to maximize our day and our energy is going to be the key to our success, the key to our happiness, and the key to a long, prosperous life. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me, coachingincession at gmail.com. And I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone, take care.